A few weeks later, coming early one morning into Singapore from a journey to the southward, I saw the brig lying at anchor in all her usual symmetry and splendor of aspect as though she had been taken out of a glass case and put delicately into the water that very moment. She was well out in the roadstead, but I steamed in and took up my habitual berth close in front of the town. But before we had finished breakfast, a quartermaster came to tell me that Captain Allen's boat was coming our way. His smart gig dashed alongside, and in two bounds he was up our accommodation ladder and shaking me by the hand with a nervous grip, his eyes snapping inquisitively, for he supposed I had called at the Seven Isles group on my way. I reached into my pocket for a nicely folded little note, which he grabbed out of my hand without ceremony and carried off on the bridge to read by himself. After a decent interval, I followed him up there, and found him pacing to and fro, for the nature of his emotions made him restless, even in his most thoughtful moments. He shook his head at me triumphantly. Well, my dear boy, he said, I shall be counting the days now. I understood what he meant. He knew that those young people had settled already on a runaway match without official preliminaries. This was really a logical decision. Old Nelson would never have agreed to give up Freya peaceably to this compromising Jasper. Heavens! What would the Dutch authorities say to such a match? It sounds too ridiculous for words. But there is nothing in the world more selfishly hard than a timorous man in a fright about his little estate, as old Nelson used to call it in apologetic accents. A heart permeated by a particular sort of funk is proof against sense, feeling, and ridicule. It's a flint. Jasper would have made his request all the same and then taken his own way. But it was Freya who decided that nothing should be said on the ground that Papa would only worry himself to distraction. He was capable of making himself ill, and then she wouldn't have the heart to leave him. Here you have the sanity of feminine outlook and the frankness of feminine reasoning. And for the rest, Miss Freya could read Poor Dear Papa in the way a woman reads a man, like an open book. His daughter once gone, old Nelson would not worry himself. He would raise a great outcry and make no end of lamentable fuss, but that's not the same thing. The real agonies of indecision, the anguish of conflicting feelings, would be spared to him, and as he was too unassuming to rage, he would, after a period of lamentation, devote himself to his little estate and to keeping on good terms with the authorities. Time would do the rest, and Freya thought she could afford to wait, while ruling over her own home and the beautiful brig and over the man who loved her. This was the life for her who had learned to walk on a ship's deck. She was a ship child, a sea girl if ever there was one, and of course she loved Jasper and trusted him. But there was a shade of anxiety in her pride. It is very fine and romantic to possess for your very own a finely tempered and trusty sword blade, but whether it is the best weapon to counter with the common cudgel play of fate, that's another question. She knew that she had the more substance of the two. You needn't try any cheap jokes. I am not talking of their weights. She was just a little anxious while he was away, and she had me, who, being a tried confidant, took the liberty to whisper frequently, 
the sooner the better. But there was a peculiar vein of obstinacy in Miss Freya, and her reason for delay was characteristic, but not before my twenty-first birthday, so that there shall be no mistake in people's minds as to my being old enough to know what I am doing. Jasper's feelings were in such subjection that he had never even remonstrated against the decree. She was just splendid, whatever she did or said, and there was an end of it for him. I believe that he was subtle enough to be even flattered at bottom at times, and then to console him he had the brig which seemed pervaded by the spirit of Freya, since whatever he did on board was always done under the supreme sanction of his love. Yes, I'll soon begin to count the days, he repeated. Eleven months more. I'll have to crowd three trips into that. And mind you, don't come to grief trying to do too much, I admonished him. But he dismissed my caution with a laugh and an elated gesture. Pooh! Nothing, nothing could happen to the brig, he cried, as if the flame of his heart could light up the dark nights of uncharted seas and the image of Freya serve for an unerring beacon amongst hidden shoals as if the winds had to wait on his future, the stars fight for it in their courses as if the magic of his passion had the power to float a ship on a drop of dew or sail her through the eye of a needle, simply because it was her magnificent lot to be the servant of a love so full of grace as to make all the ways of the earth safe, resplendent, and easy. I suppose, I said, after he had finished laughing at my innocent enough remark, I suppose you will be off today. That was what he meant to do. He had not gone at daylight only because he expected me to come. And only fancy what has happened yesterday, he went on. My mate left me suddenly, had to, and as there is nobody to be found at a short notice, I am going to take Schultz with me, the notorious Schultz. Why don't you jump out of your skin? I tell you, I went and unearthed Schultz late last evening, after no end of trouble. I am your man, Captain, he says, in that wonderful voice of his. But I am sorry to confess, I have practically no clothes to my back. I have had to sell all my wardrobe to get a little food from day to day. What a voice that man has got. Talk about moving stones. But people seem to get used to it. I had never seen him before, and upon my word I felt suddenly tears rising to my eyes. Luckily it was dusk. He was sitting very quiet under a tree in a native compound, as thin as a lath. And when I peered down at him, all he had on was an old cotton singlet and a pair of ragged pajamas. I brought him six white suits and two pairs of canvas shoes. Can't clear the ship without a mate. Must have somebody. I'm going on shore presently to sign him on, and I shall take him with me as I go back on board to get under way. Now I am a lunatic, am I not? Mad, of course. Come on, lay it on thick. Let yourself go. I like to see you get excited. He so evidently expected me to scold that I took especial pleasure in exaggerating the calmness of my attitude. The worst that can be brought up against Schultz, I began, folding my arms and speaking dispassionately, is an awkward habit of stealing the stores of every ship he has ever been in. He will do it. That's really all that's wrong. I don't credit absolutely that story Captain Robinson tells of Schultz conspiring in Chantabun with some ruffians 
in a Chinese junk to steal the anchor off the starboard bow of the Bohemian Girl schooner, Robinson's story is too ingenious altogether. That other tale of the engineers of the Nan Shan finding Schultz at midnight in the engine room, busy hammering at the brass bearings to carry them off for sale on shore, seems to me more authentic. Apart from this little weakness, let me tell you that Schultz is a smarter sailor than many who never took a drop of drink in their lives, and perhaps no worse morally than some men you and I know who have never stolen the value of a penny. He may not be a desirable person to have on board one ship, but, since you have no choice, he may be made to do, I believe. The important thing is to understand his psychology. Don't give him any money till you have done with him, not a cent if he begs ever so. For as sure as fate, the moment you give him any money, he will begin to steal. Just remember that. I enjoyed Jasper's incredulous surprise. The devil he will, he cried. What on earth for? Aren't you trying to pull my leg, old boy? No, I'm not. You must understand Schultz's psychology. He's neither a loafer nor a cager. He's not likely to wander about looking for somebody to stand him drinks. But suppose he goes on shore with five dollars, or fifty for that matter, in his pocket. After the third or fourth glass, he becomes fuddled and charitable. He either drops his money all over the place, or else distributes the lot around, gives it to anyone who will take it. Then it occurs to him that the night is young yet and that he may require a good many more drinks for himself and his friends before morning. So he starts off cheerfully for his ship. His legs never get affected, nor his head either in the usual way. He gets aboard and simply grabs the first thing that seems to him suitable. The cabin lamp, a coil of rope, a bag of biscuits, a drum of oil, and converts it into money without thinking twice about it. This is the process, and no other. You have only to look out that he doesn't get a start. That's all. Confound his psychology, muttered Jasper, but a man with a voice like his is fit to talk to angels. Is he incurable, do you think? I said I thought so. Nobody had prosecuted him yet but no one would employ him any longer. His end would be, I feared, to starve in some hole or other. Ah, well, reflected Jasper, the Bonito isn't trading to any ports of civilization. That'll make it easier for him to keep straight. That was true. The brig's business was on uncivilized coasts with obscure rajahs, dwelling in nearly unknown bays, with native settlements up mysterious rivers, opening their somber, forest-lined estuaries among a welter of pale green reefs and dazzling sandbanks in lonely straits of calm blue water, all a-glitter with sunshine. Alone, Far from the beaten tracks, she glided, all white, round, dark, frowning headlines, stole out, silent, like a ghost, from behind points of land, stretching out, all black in the moonlight, or lay hove to, like a sleeping seabird, under the shadow of some nameless mountain, waiting for a signal. She would be glimpsed suddenly on misty, squally days, dashing disdainfully aside the short, aggressive waves of the Java Sea, or be seen far, far away, a tiny, dazzling white speck flying across the brooding purple masses of thunderclouds piled up on the horizon, sometimes on the rare mail tracks, 
where civilization brushes against wild mystery, when the naive passengers crowding along the rail exclaimed, pointing at her with interest, Oh, here's a yacht. The Dutch captain, with a hostile glance, would grunt contemptuously, Yacht? No, that's only English Jasper, a peddler. A good seaman, you say, ejaculated Jasper. Still, the matter of the hopeless Schultz, with the wonderfully touching voice. First rate, ask anyone, quite worth having, only impossible, I declared. He shall have his chance to reform in the brig, Jasper said with a laugh. There will be no temptations, either to drink or steal, where I am going to this time. I didn't press him for anything more definite on that point. In fact, intimate as we were, I had a pretty clear notion of the general run of his business. But as we are going ashore in his gig, he asked suddenly, By the way, do you know where Heemskirk is? I eyed him covertly and was reassured. He had asked the question, not as a lover, but as a traitor. I told him that I had heard in Palembang that the Neptune was on duty down about Flores and Simbawa. Quite out of his way, he expressed his satisfaction. You know, he went on, that fellow, when he gets on the Borneo coast, amuses himself by knocking down my beacons. I have to put up a few to help me in and out of the rivers. Early this year, a celebs trader, becalmed in a prow, was watching him at it. He steamed the gunboat full tilt at two of them, one after another, smashing them to pieces, and then lowered a boat on purpose to pull out a third, which I had a lot of trouble six months ago to stuck up in the middle of a mud flat for a tide mark. Did you ever hear of anything more provoking, eh? I wouldn't quarrel with the beggar, I observed casually, yet disliking that piece of news strongly, it isn't worth it. I quarrel, cried Jasper. I don't want to quarrel. I don't want to hurt a single hair of his ugly head. My dear fellow, when I think of Freya's 21st birthday, all the world's my friend, Heemskirk included. It's a nasty, spiteful amusement, all the same. We parted rather hurriedly on the quay, each of us having his own pressing business to attend to. I would have been very much cut up had I known that this hurried grasp of the hand with so long, old boy, good luck to you, was the last of our partings. On his return to the straits, I was away, and he was gone again before I got back. He was trying to achieve three trips before Freya's twenty-first birthday. At Nelson's Cove, I missed him again by only a couple of days. Freya and I talked of that lunatic, and perfect idiot, with great delight and infinite appreciation. She was very radiant, with a more pronounced gaiety, notwithstanding that she had just parted from Jasper. But this was to be their last separation. Do get aboard as soon as you can, Miss Freya, I entreated. She looked at me straight in the face, her color a little heightened, and with a sort of solemn ardor, if there was a little catch in her voice. The very next day, ah, yes, the very next day after her 21st birthday, I was pleased at this hint of deep feeling. It was as if she had grown impatient at last of the self-imposed delay. I supposed that Jasper's recent visit had told heavily. That's right, I said approvingly. I shall be much easier in my mind when I know you have taken charge of that lunatic. Don't you lose a minute. He, of course, will be on time, unless heavens fall. Yes, unless, 
she repeated in a thoughtful whisper, raising her eyes to the evening sky, without a speck of cloud anywhere. Silent for a time, we let our eyes wander over the waters below, looking mysteriously still in the twilight, as if trustfully composed for a long, long dream in the warm tropical night, and the peace all round us seemed without limits and without end. And then we began again to talk Jasper over in our usual strain. We agreed that he was too reckless in many ways. Luckily, the brig was equal to the situation. Nothing, apparently, was too much for her. A perfect darling of a ship, said Miss Freya. She and her father had spent an afternoon on board. Jasper had given them some tea. Papa was grumpy. I had a vision of old Nelson under the brig's snowy awnings, nursing his unassuming vexation and fanning himself with his hat. A comedy father... As a new instance of Jasper's lunacy, I was told that he was distressed at his inability to have a solid silver handles fitted to all the cabin doors. As if I would have let him, commented Miss Freya with amused indignation. Incidentally, I learned also that Schultz, the nautical kleptomaniac with the pathetic voice, was still hanging on to his job, with Miss Freya's approval. Jasper had confided to the lady of his heart his purpose of straightening out the fellow's psychology. Yes, indeed, all the world was his friend, because it breathed the same air with Freya. Somehow or other, I brought Heemskirk's name into conversation, and to my great surprise, startled Miss Freya. Her eyes expressed something like distress, while she bit her lip as if to contain an explosion of laughter. Oh, yes, Heemskirk was at the bungalow at the same time with Jasper, but he arrived the day after. He left the same day as the brig, but a few hours later, what a nuisance he must have been to you two, I said feelingly. Her eyes flashed at me a sort of frightened merriment, and suddenly she exploded into a clear burst of laughter. Ha, ha, ha! I echoed it heartily, but not with a game-charming tone. Ha, ha, ha! Isn't he grotesque? Ha, ha, ha! And the ludicrousness of old Nelson's inanely fierce round eyes in association with his conciliatory manner to the lieutenant presenting itself to my mind brought on another fit. He looks, I spluttered, he looks, <laughs> amongst you three, like an unhappy black beetle. <laughs> she gave out another ringing peal, ran off into her own room, and slammed the door behind her, leaving me profoundly astounded. I stopped laughing at once. What's the joke? asked old Nelson's voice, halfway down the steps. He came up, sat down, and blew out his cheeks, looking inexpressibly fatuous. But I didn't want to laugh any more. What on earth? I asked myself, have we been laughing at in this uncontrollable fashion? I felt suddenly depressed. Oh, yes. Freya had started it. The girl's overwrought, I thought, and really, one couldn't wonder at it. I had no answer to old Nelson's question, but he was too aggrieved at Jasper's visit to think of anything else. He, as good as asked me whether I wouldn't undertake to hint to Jasper that he was not wanted at the Seven Isles group, I declared that it was not necessary from certain circumstances which had come to my knowledge lately, I had reason to think that he would not be much troubled by Jasper Allen in the future. He emitted an earnest, thank God, which nearly set me laughing again, but he did not brighten up proportionately. 
It seemed Heemskirk had taken special pains to make himself disagreeable. The lieutenant had frightened old Nelson very much by expressing a sinister wonder at the government permitting a white man to settle down in that part at all. It is against our declared policy, he remarked. He had also charged him with being, in reality, no better than an Englishman. He had even tried to pick a quarrel with him for not learning to speak Dutch. I told him I was too old to learn now, sighed out old Nelson, dismally. He said I ought to have learned Dutch long before. I had been making my living in Dutch dependencies. It was disgraceful of me not to speak Dutch, he said. He was as savage with me as if I had been a Chinaman. It was plain he had been viciously badgered. He did not mention how many bottles of his best claret he had offered up on the altar of conciliation. It must have been a generous libation. But old Nelson was really hospitable. He didn't mind that, and I only regretted that this virtue should be lavished on the lieutenant, commander of the Neptune. I longed to tell him that in all probability he would be relieved from Heemskirk's visitations also. I did not do so only from the fear, absurd I admit, of arousing some sort of suspicion in his mind, as if with this guileless comedy father such a thing were possible. Strangely enough, the last words on the subject of Heemskirk were spoken by Freya, and in that very sense, the lieutenant was turning up persistently in old Nelson's conversation at dinner. At last I muttered a half-audible, Damn the lieutenant! I could see that the girl was getting exasperated, too. And he wasn't well at all, was he, Freya? Old Nelson went on moaning. Perhaps it was that which made him so snappish. Half eh, Freya? He looked very bad when he left us so suddenly. His liver must be in a bad state, too. Oh, he will end by getting over it, said Freya impatiently. And do leave off worrying about him, Papa. Very likely you won't see much of him for a long time to come. The look she gave in exchange for my discreet smile had no hidden mirth in it. Her eyes seemed hollowed, her face gone wane in a couple of hours. We had been laughing too much, overwrought, overwrought by the approach of the decisive moment. After all, sincere, courageous, and self-reliant as she was, she must have felt both the passion and the compunction of her resolve, the very strength of love which had carried her up to that point must have put her under a great moral strain in which there might have been a little simple remorse too, for she was honest, and there across the table sat poor old Nelson, staring at her, round-eyed and so pathetically comic in his fierce aspect as to touch the most lightsome heart. He retired early to his room to soothe himself for a night's rest by perusing his account books. We two remained on the veranda for another hour or so, but we exchanged only languid phrases on things without importance, as though we had been emotionally jaded by our long day's talk on the only momentous subject, and yet there was something she might have told a friend but she didn't. We parted silently. She distrusted my masculine lack of common sense, perhaps. Oh, Freya! Going down the precipitous path to the landing stage, I was confronted in the shadows of boulders and bushes by a draped feminine figure whose appearance startled me at first. It glided into my way suddenly from behind a piece of rock, but in a moment it occurred to me that it could be no one else but Freya's maid, 
a half-caste Malacca Portuguese. One caught fleeting glimpses of her olive face and dazzling white teeth about the house. I had observed her at times from a distance as she sat within call under the shade of some fruit trees, brushing and plaiting her long raven locks. It seemed to be the principal occupation of her leisure hours. We had often exchanged nods and smiles, and a few words, too. She was a pretty creature, and once I had watched her approvingly make funny and expressive grimaces behind Heemskirk's back. I understood from Jasper that she was in the secret, like a comedy, Carmarista. She was to accompany Freya on her irregular way to matrimony and ever after happiness. Why should she be roaming by night near the cove, unless on some love affair of her own? I asked myself, but there was nobody suitable within the Seven Isles group, as far as I knew. It flashed upon me that it was myself she had been lying in wait for. She hesitated, muffled from head to foot, shadowy and bashful. I advanced another pace, and how I felt is nobody's business. What is it? I asked very low. Nobody knows I am here, she whispered, and nobody can see us, I whispered back. The murmur of words, I've been so frightened, reached me. Just then, forty feet above our head, from the lighted veranda, unexpected and startling, Freya's voice rang out in a clear, imperious call. Antonia! With a stifled exclamation, the hesitating girl vanished out of the path. A bush nearby rustled the silence. I waited, wondering. The lights on the veranda went out. I waited a while longer, then continued down the path to my boat, wondering more than ever. I remember the occurrences of that visit especially, because this was the last time I saw the Nelson bungalow. On arriving at the Straits, I found cable messages, which made it necessary for me to throw up my employment at a moment's notice and go home at once. I had a desperate scramble to catch the mail boat, which was due to leave next day. But I found time to write two short notes, one to Freya, the other to Jasper. Later on, I wrote at length, this time to Ellen alone. I got no answer. I hunted up, then his brother, or rather half-brother, a solicitor in the city, a sallow, calm little man who looked at me over his spectacles thoughtfully. Jasper was the only child of his father's second marriage, a transaction which had failed to commend itself to the first grown-up family. You haven't heard for ages, I repeated with secret annoyance. May I ask what for ages means in this connection? It means that I don't care whether I ever hear from him or not, retorted the little man of law, turning nasty suddenly. I could not blame Jasper for not wanting his time in correspondence with such an outrageous relative. But why didn't he write to me? A decent sort of friend, after all. Enough of a friend to find, for his silence, the excuse of forgetfulness naturally to a state of transcendental bliss. I waited indulgently, but nothing ever came, and the East seemed to drop out of my life without an echo, like a stone falling into a well of prodigious depth.